Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California, San Francisco. And today I will be giving you an introduction to the beta-lactam antibiotics within the group A streptococcal pharyngitis module. By the end of this module, you should be able to describe the mechanism of action, drug interactions, toxicities, and resistance profile of the beta-lactam antibiotics. You should also be able to compare and contrast the spectrums of activity associated with the penicillins discussed. Beta-lactams include a wide variety of antibiotics. Penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems are all beta-lactams. Monobactams, such as estreonem, are structurally similar, but they lack one of the two rings that beta-lactams have and thus have little or no cross-allergenicity with other beta-lactams. It is useful to group beta-lactams into these classes, which share similar characteristics. Let's start by learning the things that all beta-lactams have in common. All beta-lactams share the beta-lactam ring as part of their chemical composition, pictured here within the penicillin core. Beta-lactams also share a common mechanism of action which we will briefly review now. During normal bacterial cell growth, transpeptidase enzymes, known as penicillin binding proteins, act in the bacterial cell wall to bind peptide side chains, as shown here. This reaction forms the crosslinks that compose the bacterial cell wall. When penicillin, or another beta-lactam antibiotic, is added to the system, it enters and permanently blocks the active site of the penicillin binding protein, preventing it from catalyzing the formation of the bacterial cell wall. This is where penicillin binding protein gets its name. In the absence of cell wall integrity, cell death ensues. As you can imagine, the effectiveness of the beta-lactam antibiotics relies on their ability to reach the penicillin binding protein intact and their ability to bind successfully to the enzyme. Hence, there are two main modes of bacterial resistance to beta-lactams. First, if the bacterium produces an enzyme called beta-lactamase, also known as penicillinase, this enzyme will hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring, rendering the antibiotic ineffective. The genes encoding these enzymes may be inherently present in the bacterial chromosome and expression may be induced by exposure to the beta-lactam antibiotics. This is called inducible resistance. Conversely, the enzyme may be acquired via plasmid transfer. A second mechanism of resistance is that the bacterium may alter the structure or composition of its penicillin binding protein, preventing the beta-lactam from binding appropriately. It is important to understand some of the pharmacologic properties associated with the beta-lactams. First, some of these drugs are able to be absorbed orally, but not all of them. When they are taken orally, they are best absorbed on an empty stomach, and this leads to some of the GI intolerance that's associated with the beta-lactams. Some preparations are only available in intravenous or intramuscular form. Beta-lactams distribute well into most tissues. Penetration into the central nervous system during states of inflammation, such as with meningitis, is moderate. Because of this property, beta-lactams are one of the first-line agents for the empiric treatment of bacterial meningitis. Some minor hepatic metabolism occurs in certain beta-lactams more than others. However, dosage adjustment in liver disease is not required and the beta-lactams generally have minimal interaction with cytochrome enzymes within the liver, and therefore they have minimal interactions with other drugs. Penicillin and its metabolites are rapidly excreted in the urine via tubular secretion and glomerular filtration. For this reason, dosage adjustment is required for most beta-lactam antibiotics in the setting of renal dysfunction. All beta-lactams also share some common adverse features. First, beta-lactams can cause hypersensitivity reactions, ranging from mild rashes to drug fever, acute interstitial nephritis, or anaphylaxis. 
penicillin is the most commonly reported medication allergy, self-reported by about 5 to 10% of all patients. However, in large-scale studies of penicillin skin testing, approximately 85 to 90% of these patients reporting an allergy are found to not have positive skin tests and are able to tolerate penicillins. In addition, the prevalence of immunoglobulin E, or IgE-mediated penicillin allergy, which is the type of allergy that can involve life-threatening anaphylaxis, appears to have declined significantly over the last two decades based on the rate of positive penicillin skin tests, which is less than 1%. There is some cross-reactivity among the different beta-lactam classes, but it is difficult to predict exactly how often that it will occur. The likelihood of cross-sensitivity is related to similarities between various beta-lactam side chains. Studies on this matter differ greatly in their conclusions, but on a whole, cross-reactivity seems to be much lower between different types of beta-lactams than previously thought. In terms of other adverse events, seizures can result from very high doses of any beta-lactam. Some are more notorious for this adverse effect than others. Accumulation to toxic levels can occur, especially when the dose of beta-lactam is not properly adjusted for a patient's renal function. The overall most common adverse effect of beta-lactams is their GI side effects, which occurs in up to 10% of patients. Penicillins are one of the largest and oldest classes of antimicrobial agents. Since the development of the natural penicillins in the 1930s, further penicillin development has been directed by the need to combat increasing antimicrobial resistance. All penicillins have several things in common. Number one, they have very short half-lives, typically less than two hours, and so must be dosed multiple times per day. Also, like other beta-lactams, penicillin can cause hypersensitivity reactions. Finally, many penicillins are relatively poorly absorbed, even those available as oral formulations. This can lead to diarrhea when oral therapy is needed. Because of these limitations, penicillins are typically not used to treat infections empirically, meaning before culture data with sensitivities is obtained. One important exception to this rule is syphilis, where penicillin is always effective and remains the drug of choice for all stages of the disease. Penicillin is also still very useful for many types of strep infection, especially group A strep infection, which is almost universally sensitive to penicillin. However, strep pneumonia resistance to penicillin has been increasing. Due to the development of resistance in the form of beta-lactamases, the basic structure of penicillin was modified to resist these destructive enzymes, leading to what is known as the anti-staphylococcal penicillins because staphylococci are known to carry beta-lactamases. This modification gave these drugs activity against staphylococci. However, penicillin still lacked activity against gram-negative infections. That changed with the advent of the amino penicillins, which are more water-soluble and pass through porin channels in the cell wall of some gram-negative organisms. These drugs have the ability to kill some gram-negative bacteria and are often used for upper respiratory tract and ear infections. The downside is that they are susceptible to beta-lactamases, and resistance to them has become fairly common. Amino penicillins are rarely active against staphylococci for this reason. None of the penicillins that we have discussed thus far offer appreciable activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a common healthcare-associated pathogen that is often resistant to multiple antibiotics. Enter the anti-pseudomonal penicillins. These agents are active against Pseudomonas and other more drug-resistant gram-negative organisms as well. However, they are just as susceptible to beta-lactamases as penicillin and ampicillin, so they do not work against staph infections. Also, strains of gram-negative bacteria that produce beta-lactamases are resistant to them as well. They do have some activity against enterococci and streptococci. Up until now, it seems that we have learned how to make a penicillin either resistant to beta-lactamases or how to make it more active against gram-negative infections, but not both. This is why the beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations were developed. Beta-lactamase inhibitors counter beta-lactamases 
by mimicking the structure of beta-lactams, but they have little antimicrobial activity on their own. How they work is that they bind to the beta-lactamases irreversibly, preventing the beta-lactamase from destroying any beta-lactams that are co-administered and thus enabling the therapeutic beta-lactam to be effective. Remember that the beta-lactamase inhibitor only frees up the beta-lactam to kill the organism. It does not enhance the antibiotic's spectrum of activity. Therefore, the combination products are active only against the bacteria that the beta-lactam in the combination has intrinsic activity against. For example, piperacillin tazobactam, brand name Zosin, has activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but amoxicillin clavulinate, brand name Augmentin, does not. This is because piperacillin has activity against Pseudomonas, but amoxicillin does not. Because these agents have activity against both aerobes and anaerobes, these antibiotics are a good choice for mixed infections, such as intra-abdominal infections, bite wounds, or diabetic ulcers. Also, given their broad activity, another major use of these antibiotics is for empiric therapy of healthcare-associated infections. However, they are very broad spectrum, so don't forget to narrow your antibiotic coverage once culture data returns. Thank you for your attention.